Welcome to Harry's World. Don't be fussy. Hello. Ya karabudu wa ya kanastain. What is radical Islam? There is only one Islam, and that is the Islam we follow of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There is no other Islam. This Islamic terrorism, Islamic radicalism, and sadly used by leaders, this has been the main reason for this Islamophobia. I'm sad to say that we Muslim leaders have not addressed this issue either. After 9-11, when this thing came about war against radical Islam, Rather than Muslim leaders trying to explain to the West that there is no such thing as radical Islam, in all human communities, they are radicals. They are liberals and rest are moderate. All human communities, Christians, Jews, everyone has it. But Islam is not radical. Neither Judaism, neither Christianity, neither Hinduism. No religion preaches radicalism. All, the basis of all religion is compassion and justice. In Islam, the Prophet announced that everyone was free to practice his religion. It was a sacred duty to, 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 to protect the places of worship of all religions. He announced that every person is equal in front of law, whatever his religion or his color. The Prophet lives in our hearts. When he's ridiculed, when he's insulted, it hurts the, as we human know, we human beings understand one thing, the pain of the heart is far, far, far more hurtful than physical pain. Do not use freedom of speech to cause us pain by insulting a holy prophet. That's all we want. 70,000, 70,000 people killed in a war we had nothing to do with. No Pakistani was involved in 9-11. Uh, uh, Taliban were in Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda was in Afghanistan. What had we to do with it? 70,000 Pakistanis died. He said, we have problems with you. There are terrorist attacks, which we know are instigated from, uh, by India in Balochistan. We caught a spy, Kalbushan Yadev who admitted what, was, what the sabotage going on in Karachi and Balochistan. So we said, look, let's leave that behind. Let's move forward. Our main priority should, should be our people. The entire campaign, almost the entire campaign of Mr. Modi in the election was how he had taught Pakistan a lesson that they had jets had killed 350 terrorists. Complete lie. They had just killed about 10 trees of ours which was quite painful given that, you know, we are growing all these trees. Uh, he then, when India went against 11 United Nations Security Council resolutions, which say that the people, Kashmir is a disputed territory and the people of Kashmir have the right of self-determination. They went against that. They went against Sim Simla Accord, which is about bilateral, uh, sorting out our differences through bilateral means, went against that. They actually went against the Indian Constitution. Illegally, they revoked Article 370, which gave Kashmir the special status. They got an extra 180,000 troops there. Total number of security forces in Kashmir now are 900,000. And they put 8 million people of Kashmir under curfew. RSS was an organization that was inspired by Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, came about in 1925. They believed in racial purity, racial superiority. They also believed they were an Aryan race like the Nazi believed they were an Aryan race. All that I'm saying can be verified. Hatred for the Muslims and for the Christians because they believed that this golden age of Hindu civilization 
was stopped because of Muslim rule centuries back and then the British rule of India. So it was racial superiority and hatred for Muslims and Christians. And these terrorists butchered 2,000 Muslims and 150,000 Muslims were made homeless. Narendra Modi could not travel to the U.S. because of that. And I need to make you understand this background before I explain to you that what sort of a mindset would lay siege to 8 million people with 900,000 troops? Women, children, sick people, locked in as animals. In fact, of what I know of England, if 8 million animals were locked in, the RSPCA would have made a lot of noise about it. These are human beings. And it's arrogance that makes people make mistakes and do stupid things. Cruel things like what Narendra Modi has done. It's sheer arrogance. And it's arrogance that has blinded him from the fact that what is going to happen when the curfew is lifted? Has he thought about it? This hasn't been thought through. What is he going to do when he lifts the curfew? Does he think that people of Kashmir will quietly accept the status quo because the, India has changed the constitution and taken away the special status? They'll accept that? Mr. President, 100,000 Kashmiris have died in the past 30 years because they were denied the right given by the United Nations, the right for self-determination. 100,000 have died and 11,000 women have been raped. There are two human rights, United Nations human rights reports on this. The world hasn't done anything because India is a huge market, 1.2 billion people. Sadly, the material prevails over the human. But this has serious consequences. Again, I repeat, that's why I'm here. When the curfew is lifted, it will be a bloodbath. The people will come out. There are 900,000 troops there. They haven't come to, as Narendra Modi says, he's done this to for prosperity of Kashmir. This is supposed to be for the development. These 900,000 troops, what are they going to do when, the demo, when they come out? There'll be a bloodbath. Has he thought it through what happens then? 13,000 boys have been picked up and taken to God knows which destinations. So what do they think? What, what, what will the people of Kashmir do when they lift the curfew? They will be out in the streets. And what will these soldiers do? They will shoot them. They've already used pellet guns, blinded young boys. In the last six years, the, the five years, the oppression that has gone on in Kashmir. And so Kashmiris will be further radicalized. The defense minister said there are 500 terrorists lined up on the border to go in. Why would Pakistan send 500 terrorists when there are 900,000 troops? What impact are they going to make? What will they do? And why would? Don't we know that the moment there is some terrorist attack, all that will happen is there'll be further cruelty and oppression of the people of Kashmir. We will just give the 900,000 troops to further crush the people of Kashmir. The moment you use this, this catchword, Islamic terrorism, the whole world turns away. No one talks about human rights. You can do whatever you want, which is what has happened in Kashmir, because they keep using this word, Islamic terrorism. Are we a, a children of a lesser God? Is it not going to cause us pain? If there is a bloodbath, there will be Muslims becoming radicals, not because of Islam because of what they will see, that there's no justice when it comes to Muslims. There were Rohingya Muslims, my, Myanmar, who, was, who are, God knows, almost a million people out, ethnic cleansing. What was the response of the world community? So what do you think will be the response of 
1.3 billion Muslims. I picture myself. I'm in Kashmir. I've been locked up for 55 days. I have heard about and their rapes, Indian Army going into homes, soldiers. I, would, I, would I want to live this humiliation? Would I want to live like that? I would pick up a gun. You're forcing people. You are forcing people into radicalization. When people lose the will to live, what is there to live for? And this is what, if you can do this to human beings, you are actually radicalizing people. There will be a reaction to this. Pakistan will be blamed. Two nuclear armed countries will come face to face like we came in February. And before we head in that direction, the United Nations has a responsibility. This is why This is why the United Nations came into being in 1945. You were supposed to stop this happening. I feel we are back to 1939. Munich. Czechoslovakia has been taken, annexed. What is the world community going to do? Is it going to appease a market of 1.2 billion, or is it going to stand up for justice and humanity if a convention war starts and it could, anything could happen? But supposing a country seven times smaller than its neighbor is faced with the choice, either you surrender or you fight for your freedom till death, what will we do? I ask myself this question. And my belief is, la, 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 there is no God but one. And we will fight. And when, and when, and when, and when a nuclear armed country fights to the end, it will have consequences far beyond the borders. It will have consequences for the world, which is why I repeat I'm here. Because I'm warning you, it's not a threat. It's a fair worry that where are we headed? And it is, I've come here to tell the UN, you've got to. This is a test for the United Nations. You are the one who guaranteed the people of Kashmir the right of self-determination. <laughs> they are suffering because of that. And this is the time. This is the time not to appease like in 1939 appeasement took place. This is the time to take action. And number one action must be that India must lift this inhuman curfew, which has lasted for 55 days. It must free, it must free all political prisoners, and especially those 13,000 boys that have been picked up. Parents don't know where they've disappeared. The world community must give the people of Kashmir the right of self-determination. Thank you. Thank you for watching.